Pray for the pastor to have a safe trip home. Yes, Lord. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 take your Bibles and turn to the book of Esther in the Old Testament. Now I know if you're in my Sunday school class you probably think I'm just fascinated with the Old Testament because I spend a lot of time there. But you know what? I know we're a New Testament church but we shouldn't disregard the Old Testament. There's so much value that we can learn from the Old Testament and a lot of times I think we ignore it because we spend too much time focusing on being a New Testament church. Well, guess where the, you know what the people in the New Testament had? The Old Testament. So, if it was good for them, it's good for us. But we're going to look in the book of Esther, we're going to look in chapter 2 and start there tonight in verse 21 and read down to verse 23 and then we'll go over to chapter 6. But I want to talk to you tonight about coping when you're feeling unappreciated. How do you deal with it? I think we're going to look in our passage and find some interesting things out. Let me get my notes out here. But it begins in verse 21 in the book of Esther. It says, In those days, while Mordecai sat in the king's gate, two of the king's chamberlains, Bigthan and Teresh, of those who, which kept the door, were wroth. And they sought to lay hand on the king of uh, Ahasuerus. And the thing was known to Mordecai, who told it unto Esther the queen, and Esther certified the king thereof in Mordecai's name. And when inquisition was made of the matter, it was found out. <coughs> Therefore they were both hanged on a tree, and it was written in the book of the Chronicles before the king. Now Mordecai's done something here. You understand, Mordecai is there at the gate and he hears a plot about killing the king from his inner chamber. These people were angry with the king and so they decide to kill him. Mordecai hears it. What's he do? He tells the queen, Esther. Now understand that Mordecai and Esther are related. Mordecai was the uncle of Esther. So they had a connection. And so he tells her, and she goes to tell the king in Mordecai's name. And Mordecai's found this out. So they look into the matter and they find out, yes, there is a plot to kill the king. And they take the two men that were going to kill him and they hang them. So Mordecai, in fact, saved the life of the king. That's a pretty big thing. So we go over to chapter 6. And we look at the first three verses in chapter 6. It says, on that night could not the king sleep. Now, the king is having problems sleeping. And I know none of us ever have that problem, do we? Do you think about a king or a leader? They, they sleep like babies, don't they? Nothing bothers them. Every now and then they wake up. They got a lot of problems going on. There's a lot of things they think about, a lot on their mind. So the king couldn't sleep. And so what he did, he's, he commanded to, to bring the book of the records of the Chronicles and they were read before the king. So all the things that had been written are being read to the king. All the things that had been taking place in his kingdom. Verse 2. And it was found written that Mordecai had told of Bigthana and Teres, two of the king's chamberlains, the keepers of the door, who sought to lay hand on the king Ahasuerus. And the king said, What honor and dignity hath been done to Mordecai for this? Then said the king's servant that ministered to him, There is nothing done for him. Now you think about this. Here's a man that did something pretty monumental. He saved the king's life. 
you would think he would at least get thank you very much. Now, you put yourself in that position. Let's say the mayor of North Charleston was here and somebody was threatening his life and you saved his life. Or maybe the governor of the state of South Carolina or even the president of the United States. If you say, I know some of you are snickering, but if you saved the president's life, think about it. That would be front page news, wouldn't it? It would be all over the networks. People would be throwing parades in your honor. You'd be having a nice big dinner to honor you. Maybe not with this president, I understand, but you know what I mean. All the things that happen, we'd be going, wow, they'd be making a big deal about it. This person's life would change because everyone would say, wow, look at them, look at what they did. And yet, here's a man that did something really big. He saved the king's life. And the king asked what was done for him to honor and give dignity to him. And the Bible says, the reply was, there was nothing done for him. Now, it would be easy if you were in Mordecai's shoes. When you've done something here, I mean, we're not talking something insignificant. You're talking something very big, very major. Save the king's life. You do something like that, and you don't even get so much as, again, a thank you. I feel a little unappreciated, right? Well, I don't care that I saved the king's life. It's like it's no big deal. Okay, well, how do you deal with that? They don't care what I do. They don't appreciate the things that I do. Well, Mordecai continued to do what Mordecai was doing. He didn't quit. He didn't give up. He just kept on doing. How do we behave when we feel unappreciated? Now, i got to tell you, I look around here tonight, and I can say this. I think, honestly, there's not one person in this room that at some point in your life has not felt unappreciated or has not felt like no one appreciates you. You felt taken for granted, overlooked. Maybe what you do is insignificant, no big deal. It could happen in a workplace. I was in the military. A lot of times when you're in the military, what you do, nobody cares about. I can remember one time I was in there and my uh, chief came up to me and he said, well, guess what? I have a project for you. Really? What's that? He said, I'm going to let you clean the bilges and paint the bilges. Now, if you don't know what a bilge is, that's the bottom of the boat. It's where all the oil and water and dirty, nasty stuff collects. She said, he was going to allow me the privilege of going diving in this bilge and cleaning all that out, then chipping away the old rusty parts, scrubbing them up all, getting the rust off, and then priming and painting it. Isn't that a great deal? And I said, you know what? I'll be happy to do it. You know why? Because when I did that, people left me alone. Nobody else wanted to do it. So they just walk away and leave you at it. It was like a vacation. So I go and I spend a week and I'm going to Machinery 2 lower level bilge and I'm cleaning because that was our space. I'm cleaning it. I mean, the, there's no oil, there's no grease, there's no water. It's cleaned up, rust is removed, I've primed it, I've painted it, it looks great. <coughs> a week after that, or after I've done that, the captain comes by to inspect the place. And you know what the captain says? Great job, chief. You did so good getting your spaces in shape. I'm looking around and so I don't remember seeing the chief in the bilge. I don't remember seeing anybody else in the bilge with me. That was me. Do you think anybody said, thank you, Tom? Thank you, Petty Officer Green, for getting in there and getting your, dirt, your uniform all greasy and nasty and dirty, getting paint all over yourself? No. Now, it would be easy for me to feel unappreciated. And sometimes I have to admit I did. But again, that week of being left alone was worth it. If you're in the military, you'll know what I mean. But you get in the workplace, maybe you go every single day and you do your job. 
and you work hard, you put in not only the effort required to do the job, you put in extra effort. You do little things that go unnoticed by other people. Maybe you get in early and you start the coffee. <clears throat> so when everybody else gets there, they can have a cup of coffee. Maybe you stay late. Maybe you clean the place up. Maybe you do all these different things. And no one ever says, thank you. And you see other people get pats on the back. But nobody ever acknowledges anything you ever do. That can be a little hard to take, can't it? We had those things that we had in the workplace, especially when you dealt with the military, had the dreaded evals. They would give you evaluations and they would rate you how you did on your job. I personally hated evals. I could care less about evals. Because they're rigged. They would get high evals to people they were trying to get rid of. And the people that actually did their job would get low evals. And what would seem like a very fair practice. But that's the way it was. But you would see people get rewarded for doing nothing. And here you are killing yourself for the company or for the military or for whoever and you don't get so much as a thank you. But it doesn't just happen in the workplace. You know what? It can happen in the home too, can it? You're a husband, you're a wife, mother, a father. You do all these things. They're laughing because I was talking about my wife earlier. <coughs> I love my wife. This is on there. I love you so much. You're the best thing in the world. I did that. I covered my tracks. So anyway, we get in the home and, you know, you work hard to put a roof over your family's head, a food on the table, clothes on their backs, give them extras. You do all of these things. And you do the yard work to keep the place looking nice. You may do maintenance to keep the house looking good. You cook. You clean. You do laundry. And so many times you're doing all of these things and no one ever says thank you. You cook a nice meal, you put it on the table, you say, here you go. And you know what they do? We're having that again. Again? We just had that. I don't want that. Well, you know what my mama used to say? You don't want what I fix? That's fine. Go get yourself a can of potted meat. <laughs> now, that's what I would do. She make meatloaf. I didn't like meatloaf. I do now, but I didn't then. She go, well, you don't like it. You know what? We go eat you some potted meat. Okay. That was a treat. But you can do all of these things. And you know why? You, I, I get this sometimes. I do a lot of the cooking in my house. Okay, let's face it. I do most of the cooking in my house. My wife works. My kids are at work. <coughs> so I have the time. I don't mind. I enjoy it. But a lot of times I've, I, I'm sitting here, and you know what I get calls every day? What's for dinner? Not thank you for fixing food. It's what's for dinner? Knowing that there's always going to be something there to eat. But sometimes we can take it for granted that that's all going to be done, and we don't do a good job of saying, I appreciate you and what you do. Whether it's the mom or the dad, the husband or the wife. And you know what? We're not immune to taking each other for granted as husband and wife either. We, don't, we just think it's understood. Well, I don't have to tell you I love you. You understand that, right? You know what? You better say it. They want to hear it. Whether it's the husband or the wife. They both want to hear it. They want to know that you're appreciated. So it can happen within the home. You know, it can also happen in the church. There's a lot of things that go on in the church. Now, there's some that are just out there in the open. People can see it. Pastor gets up and he preaches three times a week. And he stands up here and he's put time in studying. And you see all that. People teach a Sunday school class. You see those type of things. It's real easy. And we can appreciate that. But there's a lot of little things that maybe not be so monumental, that might seem insignificant, but there's things that take place that you never see. 
that are just as important, that are just as necessary to the work of the ministry of the church. Now the most important thing we do is the preaching of the word. But there's other things that take place that need to take place. If not, it impacts how we do things in the church. <clears throat> I'll give you an example. Have you ever asked yourself this? Gee, I need to put my check, my tithing check in an envelope. Where will I find one? And you look in the pew and magically there it is. And every week you come in and you find that tithing envelope. It's never empty. Someone fills it up. Well, you wonder who does that. Or maybe you don't. You just take it for granted. There's some kind of a dispenser in the back of the pew that just pops up. Like, a, I don't know. Oh, there's other things that take place. You ever wonder who cleans the church? Now, some of you know, and we acknowledge that, and we appreciate Miss Monica knows that clean the church. But there are a lot of times we say thank you, but our actions don't show that we're really meaning it. You say, well, what do you mean by that? She comes in here and she spends three, four hours cleaning the church by herself. We say, well, yes, thank you, thank you. But you know what we do on Sundays? We come in here on Sundays or Wednesdays and we have our service and we leave candy wrappers in the pews. We leave books out. We leave wrappers or flyers or whatever it might be. And we come in on Sunday and they're magically gone. Or we come in on Wednesday and they're magically gone. And we say, how did that happen? You know why? Someone took the time to clean up after you. You're adults. Now, I know I might sound like I'm being a little harsh. But I'm just trying to tell you. Someone does these things. You may not see it, but it happens. And when we say, oh, I appreciate you, but we leave stuff laying around for them to pick up, our actions say something totally different than what our mouth does. And it's just like when the pastor's up here and he's preaching and he's giving you a message, you know what? You run up to him after the message and say, you messed up. You, you misquoted that. You went to the wrong verse. You know what you're saying to him? I don't care about anything you have. That's the only thing I got. Your actions say you don't appreciate the time and effort that he put in to prepare the message. I'm just being honest with you. Then. Now, <clears throat> the point of the message tonight is not to sit here and attack anybody or to make you feel guilty. You know what? Every single one of us is guilty of taking people for granted. We all do that. The way we act, the way we talk, just not acknowledging what people do. I remember one of the things when I first I came into this church, I remember years ago when I first came here, every Sunday you would go in there in the kitchen and there was coffee and donuts. And the lights were on and everything was ready to go. I never gave it a second thought about who came in and turned the lights on. Who opened up the church? I never gave a second thought about who started the coffee or put the donuts out. I never gave a second thought about who closed the church up at night. And then one day it hit me. Someone does these things. Do we ever say, thank you? There was years ago we had... Um, a little cafe out here in the information center. We put co coffee and donuts and chocolate milk and orange juice. <clears throat> we did that for a while. And people would come in and the first thing they would do, even if they were late to church, instead of coming in the service, they ran over and got a donut. They'd get something to drink or something to eat. They were more for, worried about feeding their stomachs than feeding their souls. I hate to say that, but that's the way it would be. They would rush over here to get this. And it got to the point where this was becoming a very expensive thing to do. So we had to stop it. And the first week we stopped it, no one said, oh, I appreciate the people that did this who set it up. Because nobody asked who set it up and got it ready. You know what they said? Where are my donuts? Where's my chocolate milk? They complained. Makes you feel appreciated, doesn't it? You get the idea. See, we all feel unappreciated, whether it's in the workplace, whether it's in the home, whether it's in the church. And there's a lot of things that get done. People set up tables and, and fix meals. 
Think about it. We had a meal not too long ago. Who had Somebody had to go back there and get it ready so we could go and eat when the service was over. But probably no one got told thank you. Now again, the point is not so you have to say, oh boy, gee, I'm feeling bad now. The point of the message is this. You're going to be in those shoes one day where you're feeling unappreciated. Satan wants you to feel unappreciated, taken for granted, overlooked, undervalued. You know why? If he can get you to feel that way, he will get a foothold in your life so that he can get you discouraged. Why are you doing this? No one cares. No one appreciates you. No one appreciates you leading the music. Nobody appreciates you playing the piano. Nobody appreciates you ushering. Nobody appreciates you doing the ball. Nobody appreciates you. All of those things. Why? Because if you can get you discouraged, feeling unappreciated, you start to feel resentful. <clears throat> Look at all the things that I do and no one cares. Why am I doing it for these people when they don't appreciate me? And it could be in the church, it could be in the home, or it could be in the workplace. We say, I'm not appreciated. So you know what? Satan knows if he can do that, it will cause division within the church. And he can get you discouraged and resentful enough to say, you know what? It's not worth it. I quit. He wants to use those feelings to weaken the church, to weaken the home, to weaken you as a Christian. Why? Because a weak Christian is an unhealthy Christian. A weak home causes a weak church. A weak church is nowhere near as effective in getting the gospel out and reaching people as a healthy church, is it? So Satan wants you to feel unappreciated. He wants you to dwell on it. So the question becomes, how do I move past it? Because we know it's going to happen. Every single one of us goes through it. So how do I keep focused and keep going? How do I deal and cope with feeling unappreciated? I want to give you six quick things tonight. <clears throat> when you're feeling unappreciated, when you're feeling overlooked, when you're feeling unvalued, there are certain things you need to remember. Number one, in the book of Romans, chapter 5, verses 6 through 8, you need to remember that God knows exactly how you feel. God knows what it feels like to be unappreciated and to take, be taken for granted. Romans chapter 5 Verse 6 says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. There was a time when you did not care about God. You didn't care one iota. You didn't care about the things of God. You didn't care about the fact that God sent his son to die for you. The Bible says you were ungodly. The things of God were no big deal. But God loved you so much that he sent his son to die for you. To pay the price for your sin, because the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, that the wages of sin is death. A eternal separation from God. Now God doesn't want that to be the case. So he made a way. And that was in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, who he sent as a sacrifice for you and for me. We didn't ask for it. You know what? We didn't want it. In fact, if you read in the Gospels about Jesus when he was here, he was rejected and ridiculed and mocked by his own people. They wanted nothing to do with him. They wanted him dead. 
These were the same people Jesus came and died for. Calling for his death. Crucify him. Crucify him. They didn't care. You think he didn't feel appreciated? I'm sure he didn't. Jesus looked over to the city of Jerusalem and he saw those people that were dying in their sins and the Bible says Jesus wept. That's how little regard they had for Jesus. He loved you so much that while you were a sinner to get that ungodly and enemy he died for you. It says right here you know we might die for a good person a righteous person maybe would any of you here die for a good person maybe your wife this building would catch on fire right now how many of you would risk your life to save others in the building you save your wife your family your friends maybe but oh well I'm not really friendly with her so I'm not going to worry about her you get the idea right Jesus said, I love you and 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 you so much I'm going to, all of you I'm going to die for. Even if you don't love me, I appreciate and love you. Wow. But here's the thing. When we accept Christ as our Savior, we become a part of the family and we automatically all just appreciate God, don't we? Boy, that's such a lie. I think Christians are probably the worst at ignoring and taking God for granted. And I hate to say that, but guess what? It's true. See, the ungodly, they don't know any better. But you and I should know better. It's like being in the home and your mom fixes you a meal and you say, I don't want that. I don't appreciate that. Jesus said, I died for you. And you know what we do? Okay, what have you done for me lately? We don't care. If we did care and we didn't take him for granted, you know what? We wouldn't call on him only when we need something. So that's usually the way it is. We talk to God when we need something. We cry out because we have a financial need or a physical need. Or, oh, Lord, help me. The rest of the time, eh, I'm on my own, Lord. If we really cared about God, we would do what the Bible tells us. Jesus said, if you love me, Keep my commandments. And you know one of those commandments is be in church. Imagine that. God actually wants to spend time with his family, his people, his children. And we say, eh, no big deal. We take it for granted. We take the word of God for granted. You would think if you love God and you appreciate God, you want to know more about him. You want to know more about your loved ones, their, their dreams, their aspirations, all the things about their favorite. When you first started dating somebody, you know you want to know their favorite color. You want to know their favorite things that they liked, right? You want to show your appreciation by doing things for them. By what's your favorite flower? What's your favorite kind of candy? What's this? Well, that's how we get when we're early in our Christian stages. But you know what happens when we get a little older and we start spending time together? We start taking each other for granted a little bit and we stop doing those lovey-dovey things. And that's the way we are with God. We don't want to spend time with Him in His Word and we don't want to talk to Him until it's necessary. I know how that is, you know. I go home sometimes and nobody says a word to me until I sit down to eat. Then all of a sudden, everybody has a need. I need you to come do this. Well, guess what? I've already fixed you food. You've already eaten. I haven't eaten all day. As soon as I get that first bite in, Dad, Papa, whatever it might be, I need you. Can it wait? No. That's the way we are with God. It really is. So... We need to remember God knows how we feel when we feel unappreciated. Second thing is this. We find it in Matthew chapter 6 verse 4. You can look there. It says God sees all that you do. 
In that passage, it talks about do your alms and secretly and God will reward you openly. Just because no one else sees what you do and so they don't acknowledge you, guess what? God knows exactly what you do. God knows who fills the pew with those tithing envelopes. God knows who cleans the church. God knows who prepares the baptistry. God knows who turns the lights. God, God knows who goes out and witnesses. God knows who cuts the grass. God knows all of these things. God knows who spends time at home in prayer, praying for the people in the church. God knows all of these things. And there's things you may never ever see, may never ever acknowledge. But God knows. Years ago, when I first came to the church again, there was a man in the church named Glenn Anton. You've heard us probably talk about Miss Lily Anton. That was Miss Lily's husband, Glenn. I just saw Glenn. He was just an older man. He was coming here and he was hobbled in a little bit on Sunday. Always had a smile on his face, even though he was in tremendous pain. But you know what? I found out after he died, he would go and fill the buses up with gas. I didn't know he did that. You know what? God did. God did. And there's other things that get taken place, whether it's in the church, in the home, in the workplace, wherever. God sees it all. And guess what? Brings up the third thing. Not only does God see it, he doesn't forget about your service. He knows what you do, and he doesn't forget about it. The book of Hebrews, chapter 6, in verse 10, it says, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, and that ye have ministered to the saints, and do minister. God knows exactly what you do, and he doesn't forget. See, there might be people that forget things you do around here. After a time, God never does. God never forgets. He's got it written down and you're on his mind. Some of you may forget who used to put the donuts in there. God knows. I know. I've made it a point to find out. You know what? God laid it on my heart to find out who was doing this. He did. He put, made it a point on my heart to find out who was opening the church and who was closing the church. He opened my eyes to think, because you know what he said? You're taking people for granted. But I haven't. God said, I haven't. And one day we'll stand before God. And you know what he's going to open the books. And he's going to say, I remember you did this. I remember you did that. I remember you did that. Well done. Isn't that what we want? To hear well done? You may not ever hear it here. But just wait. God knows. He knows how you feel. He sees what you do. He doesn't forget your service. And then we need to keep the right attitude. You'll find that in Romans 15.5. When you start feeling unappreciated, you start feeling taken for granted, you start feeling like nobody cares, that you're not valued, you need to keep the right attitude. And that attitude is this. Who are you doing this stuff for? Are you doing it for the people out here so you can get a pat on the back? The Bible says we're to do all things unto God. Unto God. And when you get that attitude fixed, I'm not doing it for you, I'm doing it for God, it puts it in a whole new life. God pointed this out to me in a number of ways. I remember one time we were doing a, a, a little work day here at the church. <laughs> it was a Saturday. I've been working hard all week and I had to get up early on Saturday to come in for this work day. And you know what they did? The people that were organized had the audacity to tell me, me, Tom Green, Tom Green, that they wanted me to go in these side rooms and scrub and wax the floors. Nobody even goes in these side rooms. They don't look in there. Are you kidding me? 
You want me, and they didn't give me a, a buffer. They gave me a green scrubby pad and a bucket. I felt like I was back in the Navy. And you know what? I'm scrubbing this floor and I'm doing it with a big smile up now. I'm griping and moaning. I got up on a Saturday morning for this. Don't these people realize I got better things to do? To sit on these side rooms that nobody ever goes into and scrub the floors. And all of a sudden it was like somebody hit me upside the head. Not literally. but I thought, And I got this, who are you doing this for? It was like the Lord was speaking to me. Are you doing it to please them? Or are you doing it for my house to please me? And all of a sudden I stopped and I said, Wow, Lord, you're right. Forgive me. And I was the happiest floor scrubbing person you ever saw in your life. You know why? Because I had the wrong attitude when I started, but the Lord corrected my attitude. The Lord knew what I was doing, even if nobody saw it and recognized it. The Lord knew exactly what I was doing. I was working to improve his house. <laughs> I told you about e-valves. I hated e-valves. I used to go in when I would get evaluated by my boss every year. He would call me in his office. He would set it out there and say, okay, here's your e-valve. I'd say, where do I sign? He's like, what? I said, where do I sign? He's like, don't you want to read it? No. Am I doing something wrong? You tell me, I'll fix it. Well, I wrote some good stuff out. I don't care. And he couldn't understand it because I don't understand. I said, well, basically, it says, I don't work for you. He goes, what do you mean? I'm your boss. I said, no. God's my boss. I work for him. So you're going to get my best every single day, no matter what you write on that piece of paper, good or bad. If I'm doing something wrong, you tell me. I will fix it because I'm not doing God justice. My boss. And he just looked at me dumbfounded. But see, that was the kind of attitude that God gave me because it's real easy to get discouraged, feel unappreciated. But when you get your attitude right, it makes a whole difference, doesn't it? So we have to keep the right attitude. 1 Thessalonians 5, 18 is we need to be thankful even when others aren't. The Bible tells us we're to be thankful in all things. You know what? Even though they don't thank you and they don't appreciate what you do, you be thankful for the fact that you get to serve God. I told you about this. I didn't appreciate doing that, but once God got a hold of me, you know what? I was thankful I was able to come and scrub floors. I appreciated God giving me the opportunity to do that. It starts with the mind. We need to be like-minded and say, Lord, thank you. There was a time I thought, you know what? Before I went in the Navy, I got offered a job to work at TVA, Tennessee Valley Authority. I was a teenager out of high school. They had a job opening as a janitor, making $11 an hour. This was back in 1983. That's a lot of money for an 18-year-old kid back in 1983. And you know what I said? Uh-uh, not me. I'm going to the Navy. I'm going to the nuclear power program in the Navy. I'm going to learn training. I'm going to be something important. You know what I found out? I became a nuclear trained janitor in the Navy. I got paid a whole lot less and the hours were a whole lot worse. That's the way it was. And sometimes we could look at things and we could say, oh, I'm not going to do that. That's beneath me. But when you're doing it for God, you say, Lord, I'll do whatever you want. I'll scrub the toilets. I'll scrub the floors. I'll do whatever you want me to do. Thank you for allowing me to serve. So we got to be thankful. And then the last thing is, we need to understand that God doesn't take you for granted. Jeremiah 29 verse 11. See, everybody else in here might take you for granted, but God knows how you feel. God knows what you've done. God remembers those things that you've done. And he will not take you for granted. Ever. Ever. Now we're out of time. I'm going to wrap it up with this. When you are feeling unappreciated, don't let Satan get a foothold. Focus on what God does 
for you. The fact that he died for you. He welcomed you into his family. He knows exactly what it feels like to be unappreciated. Taken for granted. Keep in mind that nobody else may see it. Nobody else may care. But God does. Don't allow that feeling to overtake you where it becomes a festering pot of resentment and you get to the point where you just want to quit. The Bible tells us to he that overcomes, there is a crown. You keep going. You keep on chugging on. Let God be the one that gives you the pat on the back. If you're doing it just to get a pat on the back for man, guess what? That's your reward. Let God be the one that rewards you. When you stand at the judgment seat and he says, well done. Would you stand? We're going to pray and we'll be dismissed. Thank you for your time tonight. Be here Sunday morning. Brother Mike will be speaking in the morning service. I'll be speaking again Sunday night. <coughs> and Lord willing, the Lord's kind of laid on my heart a message about is it too late? Is it too late? And it has to deal with the fact is it too late for someone ever to be saved? And that's the question we're going to ask and we're going to look at it in the Bible. So let's pray and we'll go our separate ways. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this night. I thank you for the fact that you love us. You love us so much that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die for us on the cross, to pay the price of our sins. Even when we were ungodly, we were enemies. You loved us so much that you wanted to be with us. Forgive us where we fail to show the appreciation and the love that we should. Help us to stay focused and not get caught up in the fact that even though we are all susceptible to feeling unappreciated and even though we are sometimes forgetful of being thankful for others, you never are. And I pray you'll be again with our pastor and his wife as they're traveling, others that are sick and unable to be here, just lift them up to you. I pray you'll be with us at our services on Sunday, be with Brother Mike, be with our music and everything. We resound to your glory and your honor in Christ's name. Amen. Good night, everybody.